Human beings have always asked questions about the stars. It's as natural as breathing. But imagine a time before science had found out the answers. Imagine what it was like, say, hundreds of thousands of years ago, soon after the discovery of fire. We were just as smart, just as curious then as we are now. Sometimes it seems to me that there were people then who thought like this. We are wandering hunter folk. Fire keeps us warm. Its light makes holes in the darkness. It keeps hungry animals away. In the darkness, we can see each other and talk. We take care of the flame. The flame takes care of us. The stars are, are not near to us. When we climb a hill or a tree, they are no closer. They flicker with a strange, cold, white, faraway light. Many of them, all over the sky, but only at night. I wonder what they are. One night I thought, the stars are flames. They give a little light at night, as fire does. Maybe the stars are campfires, which other wanderers light at night. The stars give a much smaller light than campfires, so they must be very far away. I wonder if our campfires look like stars to the people in the sky. But why don't those campfires and the wanderers who made them fall down at our feet? Why don't strange tribes drop from the sky. Those beings in the sky must have great powers. I don't suppose that every hunter-gatherer had such thoughts about the stars, but we know from contemporary hunter-gatherer communities that very imaginative ideas arise. The mm, Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert in the Republic of Botswana have an explanation of the Milky Way. At their latitude, it's often overhead. They call it the backbone of night. They believe it holds the sky up. They believe that if not for the Milky Way, pieces of sky would come crashing down at our feet. So the Milky Way, in their view, has some practical value the backbone of night. Later on, metaphors about campfires or backbones or holes through which the flame could be seen were replaced in most human communities by another idea. The powerful beings in the sky were promoted to gods. They were given names and relatives and special responsibilities for the cosmic services they were expected to perform. There was a god for every human concern. Gods ran nature. Nothing happened without the direct intervention of some god. If the gods were happy, there was plenty of food, and humans were happy. But if something displeased the gods, and it didn't take much, the consequences were awesome. Droughts, floods, storms, wars, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, epidemics. The gods had to be propitiated. And a vast industry of priests arose to make the gods less angry. But because the gods were capricious, you couldn't be sure what they would do. Nature was a mystery. It was hard to understand the world. Our ancestors groped in darkness to make sense of their surroundings. Powerless before nature, they invented rituals and myths, some desperate and cruel, others imaginative and benign. The ancient Greeks explained that diffuse band of brightness in the night sky as the milk of the goddess Hera squirted from her breast across the heavens. We still call it the Milky Way.
In gratitude for the many gifts of the gods, our ancestors created works of surpassing beauty. This is all that remains of the ancient temple of Hera, queen of heaven. A single marble column standing in a vast field of ruins on the Greek island of Samos. It was one of the wonders of the world, built by people with an extraordinary eye for clarity and symmetry. Those who thronged that temple were also the architects of a bridge from their world to ours. We were moving once again in our voyage of self-discovery on our journey to the stars. Here, 25 centuries ago, on the island of Samos and in the other Greek colonies which had grown up in the busy Aegean Sea, there was a glorious awakening. Suddenly there were people who believed that everything was made of atoms, that human beings and other animals had evolved from simpler forms, that diseases were not caused by demons or the gods, that the Earth was only a planet going around a sun which was very far away. This revolution made cosmos out of chaos. Here, in the 6th century BC, a new idea developed, one of the great ideas of the human species. It was argued that the universe was knowable. Why? Because it was ordered, because there are regularities in nature which permit its secrets to be uncovered. Nature was not entirely unpredictable. There were rules which even she had to obey. This ordered and admirable character of the universe was called cosmos. And it was set in stark contradiction to the idea of chaos. This was the first conflict of which we know between science and mysticism, between nature and the gods. But why here? Why in these remote islands and inlets of the eastern Mediterranean? Why not in the great cities of India or Egypt, Babylon, China, Mesoamerica? Because they were all at the center of old empires. They were set in their ways, hostile to new ideas. But here, in Ionia, were a multitude of newly colonized islands and city-states. Isolation, even if incomplete, promotes diversity. No single concentration of power could enforce conformity. Free inquiry became possible. They were beyond the frontiers of the empires. The merchants and tourists and sailors of Africa, Asia and Europe met in the harbors of Ionia to exchange goods and stories and ideas. There was a vigorous and heady interaction of many traditions, prejudices, languages and gods. These people were ready to experiment. Once you are open to questioning rituals and time-honored practices, you find that one question leads to another. What do you do when you're faced with several different gods, each claiming the same territory? The Babylonian Marduk and the Greek Zeus were each considered king of the gods, master of the sky. You might decide, since they otherwise had rather different attributes, that uh, one of them was merely invented by the priests. 